The Lord be with you. Welcome to worship today. Number of announcements as we begin. Uh, first of all, just to thank you to Sunday school teachers who are getting things started again. They're Megan Zettelmoyer, Brittany Lynch, and Amanda Stout. And so we've got a wonderful children's Sunday school. So uh, we're proud of them and just really happy for the children that come. This is Loyalty Sunday, and it's a day that uh, has been in our tradition here at Zion for many years. And it's a day when we, we, t we pull away from lesser loyalties and we say our loyalty needs to be with Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, let's see. Uh, more things. Ah, uh, uh, apple dumplings. The disaster relief team is doing their apple dumpling bake. They're going to do one bake this year. So the last day to place your order for apple dumplings um, is September 25th. So uh, we've got here... Um, today and next Sunday in order to place those orders, and uh, you don't want to miss out on those apple dumplings, right? They're just wonderful. Uh, I am going to be away this week. I'm leaving um, this afternoon uh, for a retreat in outside of Chicago, and it's a, uh, it's a retreat of the Society of the Holy Trinity, and uh, that's a group of pastors that are committed to, uh, to living the, uh, the, the Lutheran confessions, and uh, I'm actually going with people you know. I'm going with uh, Pastor Mitternacht and Pastor Elkin, as well as Pastor James Fladeland from First in Watsontown. And there's another Lutheran pastor that joined our church some time ago. His name is Barry Laird, and, and he'll be there too. So uh, the Society of the Holy Trinity. I'll be back on about noon on Friday. Uh, while I'm gone, if you have a pastoral emergency, please call Pastor Justin Lingenfelter. His number is in the bulletin. And that means that a number of things won't be happening this week, uh, and that includes uh, Stephen Ministry as well as our Tuesday Bible study, but we'll resume all that um, the next week. Uh, next Sunday is Harvest Home, and so that means that uh, the envelopes that we have in our, in our boxes um, will be designated towards uh, Harvest Home for Warrior Run Neighbors Helping Neighbors, as well as the ELCA World Hunger Appeal. So the money going to a wonderful cause. Um, also, you can bring in um, canned goods, non-perishables, those sorts of things. And then also just want to uh, congratulate uh, folks who are going to be married this coming Saturday, Michael Nicholas and Megan Suters. Uh, they're getting married here at Zion. Uh, it'll be the first marriage in the new, in the new space, which is really wonderful. Um, next Saturday at 2 o'clock, and you, many of you may remember that Megan uh, was baptized here at the Vigil of Easter this year. So are there any other announcements that we want to hold up today? Any at all? Uh, Project Linus, thank you, you did that at 8 o'clock, that's right. So the Project Linus meeting is at 2 o'clock this afternoon, which uh, provides wonderful homemade blankets to, to children in need. And, and they go to hospitals and, and locally, too, don't they? Six County area. That's a tremendous ministry, so thank you for that. All right, let's begin with confession and forgiveness. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
gift of the Holy Spirit. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Lord God, you call us to work in your vineyard and leave no one standing idle. Set us to our tasks in the work of your kingdom and help us to order our lives by your wisdom. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As the choir comes forward, I want to make mention of the words to our song in the bulletin today. If you look to the next page, next to the hymn, you'll see the words to the song that we're going to be singing. Those words are the chorus. We'll be singing it three times. The choir will start with that, and then we'll sing something in between it. And then the second and third time we sing it, we'd like you to join us. Matthew, raise your hand there, Matthew. Matthew will cue you in uh, when we'll be singing that, so kind of watch for him. Let me just read the words quickly, and then we'll sing the song. Look at the words, please. We are God's people. We are his church. We are disciples of Jesus Christ our Lord, hand in hand throughout the ages, in service to his word. We stand as one, the people of God. Please enjoy and sing with us on the second and third chorus, We the People of God by Jean Ann Schaeferman.
from Amos. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain again? And the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale. We will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. The word of the Lord. I urge the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a, was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to him, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master com commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. 
For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been able, uh, if then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is yours to own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Do any of you remember the dot-com bubble of the 1990s? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, a couple people do. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about, the dot-com bubble? The dot-com bubble is sometimes also referred to as the internet boom. This is basically what it was. During the 1990s, the internet was really starting to take off. And uh, the World Wide Web, it's been, it had been created, and business people, entrepreneurs, saw the vast opportunity before them. Many new internet-based companies were formed, and they were called dot-coms. I remember my dad being in his late 80s and early 90s back then and saying, I keep hearing dot com on the TV. What is that anyway? <laughs> dot com. Companies discovered that they could cause their stock market prices to soar simply by adding a dot com to the end of their company name or maybe an E something uh, to the beginning of their name. Many people believe they could make quick money by investing in one of these internet based companies with their rapidly rising stock prices. The internet companies like Google, Amazon, eBay, you recognize those, right? That's easy. Uh, and many other long forgotten companies knew that they had to get big really quick or they would get lost in the great number of newly forming companies. So they spent more money than they earned trying to get big. And some resorted to questionable accounting practices to keep going. But in the end, uh, less than half of all those companies really survived. Lots of investors lost their shirts when the unsustainable boom finally went bust. The dot-com bubble burst around the year 2000. I don't know if you knew anybody that invested in any of that business. Uh, but I had two friends that invested in the dot-coms when the bubble began to grow. Uh, a good friend of mine uh, by the name of Dave, who was, actually belonged to my home church, he worked in banking. And he invested $3,000 he had uh, in the bank, and he, and he watched it grow considerably at first in the dot-com that he, he put it into. Uh, he had a wife and a young child, and he thought he was doing great things for their future. He told me back then, I thought I was a genius. He invested more money and just couldn't imagine an end to his good fortune. He trusted that the markets wouldn't let him down, and he was loyal to them, putting his money in there. But then the bubble burst, and Dave told me it made things difficult at home for quite a while uh, with his bills and with his wife, who was pretty angry that he'd lost so much of their money. And I thought I was a genius, Dave told me. Another friend, on the other hand, also worked in finance. Uh, she was in insurance. Her name was Tracy. She was a single woman at the time and also saw the opportunity to invest when the internet companies started taking off. But she was shrewd enough to know that what goes up must one day come down, right? So when the few thousands she had invested uh, soared to a height she never imagined possible. She sold all her stocks, paid off her student loan, 
put down a big principal payment on her house and took a couple of her good friends on a cruise. I wasn't one of them. Not only had she ensured her future home, she made good friends, even better friends. That's pretty shrewd of her, isn't it? Now, I tell these stories as a way of getting into the parable that's before us today from the Gospel of St. Luke. Jesus' parable of the shrewd manager, or as it's often called, the dishonest manager. Now, every single Bible commentary I've ever read, read on this uh, begins by saying that it's the strangest parable, the most difficult, the hardest parable that Jesus ever told. Um, and isn't it true? I mean, this guy seems to be cheating, but he gets commended, right? That's kind of weird. Well, the word parable, loosely translated, means to throw a truth. And so when Jesus tells a, a story, throws a parable out there, everybody kind of catches that truth in the story a little bit differently. So it applies to them. So certainly every scholar that I read had a different take on what truth Jesus was trying to convey here by this, by this parable. Now this, uh, what I'm going to give you today, is how I caught the truth of this parable this time around. So this parable is really about who do you trust? You know, on a loyalty Sunday, we ask, who are you loyal to? And not only is it who do you trust in this parable, but it's also, do you have an eye on your future? So, let's go over um, this, the plot of this parable again, but this time I'm going to try and fill you in on some details that would have been assumed by a listener who first heard it in the first century, but really is kind of lost on us today. So, here's the setting of the parable. Um, typical of the day and age, there's a landowner. Um, and what does he do? He, he's very wealthy. He rents out his land to tenants who farmed it. You know, we understand what that's like, right? That certainly has happened in many people's lifetime around here. And here's the deal. They agreed to pay a fixed amount of produce for the yearly rent. Now, there is a manager in this story. He's in place to oversee all of these exchanges, all of this business. But somehow this manager, he is squandering the rich man's property. Um, and we're not told exactly how, but news of being cheated gets to the landowner, the master, and he has to call the manager in to come speak with him. And uh, he says, what is this all about? What do I... What do I hear here? Give me an accounting of your manager, of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. I hear you're cheating me. Well, the landowner, actually in this parable, is shown to be a person of great integrity. Um, he was respected in the community so much that somebody tipped him off to the fact that he was being ripped off by, by this unscrupulous manager. Um, and he cared enough about his own wealth to fire that same manager, okay? If you're going to ruin my business, <laughs> then you're gone. So that's one thing, a man of great integrity. But he's also, in the story, very merciful. You know, by rights, he could have had this manager flogged for what he had done. He could have been whipped for his crimes or thrown in jail uh, for many years or even worse. But what's he do? He chooses only to fire him. Um, and then he says, turn in your records. That's really a very gracious way to treat somebody who has done such wrong to you. So, in the face of this crisis, the manager, you know, he doesn't panic, but he thinks things through. He weighs his options. Um, we even get a glimpse into his mental processes, and he says to himself, what do I do? I've been fired. You know, digging ditches is out. I'm really not strong enough for all of that. And... Um, Begging, that just isn't my style, so what now? And then he comes up with it. He says, oh, I've got it. I know what I'm going to do so that when I lose my job here, people will lay down the welcome mat at their door for me. Recognizing that the landowner is really a very merciful man, the manager counts on him to be consistent in his mercy. In Jewish law, tenant farmers had set 
had a set yearly rent to pay in produce. But if the crops didn't yield well in a particular year, maybe there was drought or disease or insects, the landowner was expected to reduce the rent for that year. So with this in mind, the manager, he calls all the tenants in one by one and has them reduce their rent. You know, of course, they don't realize that this guy's already been fired, right? <laughs> you know? The tenants assume that these reductions are authorized, they're on the up and up. Otherwise, you know, they wouldn't have cooperated. But the manager certainly lets them know that it was he who arranged for such a generous discount for the year for them. And they would naturally be grateful and remember him favorably in future dealings. And they would also look upon the master, the landowner, the, you know, as a great guy and very generous. Uh, and they'd sing his praises to one another. Did you see that? He, he reduced our rents this year. Wasn't that wonderful of him? And the landowner wasn't going to spoil the party by saying, hey, you owe me more rent. Those reductions were made by a guy I already fired, right? Uh, true or not, that would not have been accepted very well by all of those tenants. So there's nothing he can do but pay the price out of his own pocket. And that's why when the boss does catch wind of everything that's going on, he commends the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. He admires this man. He was very cunning. You know, uh, he, he worked the system, and so he can only admire it. So in summary, this manager had experienced the mercy of the landowner when he was only fired and not flogged or jailed. Then he created a situation in which his boss showed generous mercy toward all his debtors. He risked everything on the fact that when his boss found out, he would not do anything that would make him appear unmerciful before his fellow man, because the landowner is a merciful man. So, that's a way to look at this parable. So, what kind of a lesson can we draw for ourselves from this very strange tale. Think about it this way. In a parable, it's not so much uh, like a little moral teaching we're supposed to get out of it, but it's more supposed to point to the character of God, uh, the, the kingdom of God and its nature, right? So we can get from this parable that God is a God of judgment, but he's also a God of mercy. Therefore, when we hear the message, when we the message that the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent of your sins, right? And we look to see how we've lived our lives and we come up, come up wanting we are all sinners. When we confront that, that crisis, our only option is to entrust everything to the unfailing and surprising and unusual mercy of God. Because God is merciful, he will pay the price of our salvation out of his own pocket. We're to place our total trust on the mercy of God because God is always loyal to us even when we're not loyal to him. You see, the shrewdness of the manager was not so much the, the cleverness of the scam that he pulled off. Rather, his shrewdness was shown in the fact that he expected that the master would always see fit to act mercifully. Can we do the same? Can we always expect our God to act mercifully? And he will be loyal to us. All right. So do you remember my friend Dave, right? Who I talked about right at the beginning. Where did he place his trust? Foolishly, he placed his trust in the financial markets. He was loyal to them. He put his trust in the dot-coms, the promise of wealth in the here and now. Really, heaven on earth, right, we might say. But the financial markets are anything but merciful. As a matter of fact, they are merciless to the unwary. Those who lack the shrewdness to know that what goes up must also come down. Poor Dave's relationship suffered because he put his trust in the wrong people. I believe that Jesus is saying in his parable that only God, the master, is worthy of trust. And he will always treat you mercifully. The other truth of this parable that I want to hold up is that we are to live with an eye to the future. Jesus says, 
And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Now, what are we to make of that? We're supposed to, what, use dishonest wealth? What is Jesus talking about here? Actually, I think what he's giving us is an invitation to community. Yeah, they may welcome you into the eternal homes, right? That sounds like community. Um, as surprising as this may sound, take note of what the manager discovers soon after he loses his job. What's, what's he really looking for? He's looking for friends, right? <laughs> looking for friends. He realizes that his money can't save him, so he uses his financial shrewdness to create a community of support. This is an, really an odd way to build friendships, but it earns the approval of Jesus, who says, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. So, you've got to ask, is this an invitation to lie, right, if we're using dishonest wealth? Uh, no, not at all. Jesus isn't saying that we should be dishonest. Instead, he's advising us to use whatever wealth we have, what he calls dishonest wealth, however, whatever assets, resources we've got, to build a community that can endure. Because none of us is meant to live a life of isolation, and none of us is designed to practice our faith apart from the Christian community. Like the dishonest steward, we need friends to help us through the tough times in life. We need a community that we can, we can serve with whatever resources we have to offer. Remember my friend Tracy that I talked about. She may have paid off some debt with her dot com windfall, but then she took her friends out on a cruise. She treated them extravagantly and with great love. She had an eye on the future, friendship and community in her future. We as Christians have an eye on the future, both friendship and community, in our eternal home. We know that when Jesus comes again, he will raise the dead bodily, a real resurrection, and we will join with him in the new heaven and earth he will create. The kingdom of God will be revealed in its fullness, and it will be a place of eternal friendship. We as Christians know that we will be together for eternity, treating one another extravagantly and with great love. So, we are called to begin to practice today what we will do forever. We know that today may be uncertain, but our future is in the hands of our merciful Master. So may you trust in God. Be loyal to the one who is loyal to you. May you invest in friendship. We'll have our ups and downs, but in the long run, God will never burst your bubble. Amen.
God has made us as people through our baptism into Jesus Christ, living together in trust and hope, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word, even when it convicts us of our sins. Thank you for being patient with us. Thank you for lifting us up when we fall away from your commands and restoring us to positions of trust and the task of proclaiming the gospel when we have repented. Lord, in your mercy, bless your holy church throughout the world. Fill it with faithful teachers and preachers of your word. Bless, we pray, the newly installed Bishop of the Upper Susquehanna Synod, Bishop Craig Miller. Empower his ministry with your Holy Spirit and allow him to bear good fruit for your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Give loving kindness and generosity to missionaries throughout the world. We also pray that you would be with your persecuted servants throughout this world. Give them grace to speak truth and love before their enemies. We pray especially for churches in Syria, Nigeria, Nicaragua, China, Afghanistan. Lord, in your mercy, give wisdom, integrity, and common sense to our earthly leaders. Make them honest stewards of the power and authority granted to them. We pray that you would also be the shield and defender of first responders and those in the military. And especially, Lord, we ask for an end between, uh, for, the, between, for the war between Ukraine and Russia. Lord, in your mercy. We know that you raise those who are sick and care for those who cry out to you. Therefore, with hope, we remember before you all who are afflicted and need your healing power. We lift before you, especially on this day, Bobby and Jeanette Calhoun, Leroy and Ruth Kotner, Irene Watson, Shirley Mangus, Joyce Osmond, Jim Yost, Mike Benfer, Ron Seckler, Bob Hartline, uh, Marvin Crawford, Ron Koch, Ken Edwards, Larry Coker, Sharon Chamberlain, Janice Knauer, Marianne Ott, Ron Ott, Susan Grube, Lori Yost, Kathy Hillard, Marilyn, Ronnie Johnston, Tammy Wands, Sandy Rabert, Jeff Grube, Eileen Montgomery, Bob Temple, Russ Wynn, Michael Kenny, Derek Kotner, Rosa Kuhn, Jason Metzger, Emerson Metzger, Sally Schuyler Fairman, Brad Lidecker, Julia Tebbets, Charles Fisher, Al Kaufman, Tom and Walt Fogelman, Lana Marie Reed, John Greenhill, Mary Ellen Minardi, Linda Balzar, Jeffrey Herman, Donna Bridges, Ron and Bonnie Gottschall, Jim and Susie Musselman, and those that we name out loud before you. Grant them your restoration and bless those who care for them. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious and holy Father, receive into your kingdom all the faithful departed, and especially those most dear to us. Bring us all at last together in your heavenly kingdom, forever to adore and glorify you. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share the peace.
be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our duty and delight that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who calls us to follow his way of humble service and love. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join the run ending hymn. Holy, holy, holy are you, God of power and might. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in his name. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. <laughs> the body of Christ. <laughs> Let me get this right here. <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Happy are those who are called to his supper. Thanks be to God.
God. strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. 
We give you thanks, O God, for the blessings of this table. May our lives be made new by these gifts of grace, and may your love be made known through us. Amen. Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.